this is some work on uh, fixed effects matter analysis, and it's joint work with Julian Higgins, who I'm delighted to see was uh, on, on the webinar as well, uh, and Thomas Lumley, uh, who's in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, and just a, a short overview of, of what I'm going to talk about, then um, I'm going to present some work that argues that fixed effects meta-analysis, with, with a plural on, on the fixed effects there, uh, is answering a sensible question, which I'll discuss, uh, and it's doing so regardless of heterogeneity between uh, the effects in different studies that one might meta-analyze. Uh, and that's uh, quite contrary, I think, to what quite a lot of people think about uh, fixed effects meta-analysis. So it's a, an important message to get out. Uh, there are also some other questions that can be addressed uh, with fixed effects assumptions, and I'll get to those, but more briefly, um, looking at measures of heterogeneity, uh, meta-regression. There are also some work that we've done on small sample corrections and on how this all works if, if you're being Bayesian um, that I'll mention in passing but not get to in, in, in detail. Um, I'd like to uh, point out that, that uh, URL at the bottom there, the, the tinyurl.com slash fixf, uh, is a little website that I've set up which has got these slides uh, on them, but also some other resources, the papers and, and, and useful links that uh, I hope people will uh, check out if they're interested in the material that I'm going to present. So uh, on to slide uh, two then, uh, and this is just a, a generic example from uh, a clinical trial that, which um, members of the RSS or PSI uh, might be interested in, in meta-analyzing. Uh, and um, we've got a, a forest plot of, of different effects here comparing zinc to placebo uh, in uh, duration of the common cold. So how many days uh, did it take until your cold went away uh, was the outcome uh, that was measured in the zinc group and the placebo group. And we've got six studies um, indicated on, the, on with names indicated on the left there. They've got different sample sizes and different standard deviations and, and different standard errors. Some are uh, very precise, like the fourth one. Uh, some are very imprecise, like the, like the first one, uh, which also has a, a point estimate that's quite far away uh, from the rest. Um, and in meta-analyzing uh, these together, then one could, well, there, there are various approaches one could take, but uh, the two by far the most common uh, approaches are to use a fixed effects uh, estimate, which is indicated by the, the small confidence interval, the small diamond uh, at the bottom of the forest plot, and then the random effects estimate, uh, which has got a much wider uh, confidence interval in, in this case. And in particular, one of these overlaps zero, i.e. the overall estimate has a p-value less than um, uh, greater than 0.05 when comparing the, the zinc to the placebo, uh, and, and the other one doesn't. And so in practice, uh, then uh, you'd have a, a, a tough decision to make, uh, which of these would be appropriate and, and why, um, or which other uh, analysis might be appropriate if you don't like either of them, uh, or questions that you'd have to answer in practice uh, as a, as a meta-analyst of, of, of this data. And, and you know, much other data besides. So uh, we can't just ignore this difference. Uh, we want to better understand uh, what these uh, analyses are giving us and, and why they might be useful. I'm going to focus on, on the fixed effects one, as, as I mentioned. If you look in uh, really most uh, textbooks, most references on uh, meta-analysis, meta then you'll see something uh, along the lines of this Steve Goodman quote from uh, 1989. Uh, when you get to the fixed effects uh, analysis. It's called a fixed effect analysis in the singular, uh, and it would say that it's based on the assumption that the results of each trial represent a statistical fluctuation around some common effect. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, it means that the effect is the same, uh, the underlying effect, that is, uh, is the same in, in all the studies. It's, it's the standard assumption that goes with that uh, analysis that gave us the, the small confidence interval on the previous slide. So uh, in that fixed effect uh, model in the singular, uh, for uh, k different studies, we had k equals 6 in the, in the last slide, uh, we've got some uh, beta hats, uh, the effect estimate zinc versus placebo, uh, and that's a, a random quantity. Uh, we assume it has a normal distribution, uh, and the normality there is just guaranteed by the, the central limit theorem, or approximated by the central limit theorem. There's, there's nothing deep going on there. Uh, there is some standard error uh, for that beta hat called sigma i for the ith study, um, and the point estimate is centered around an underlying parameter beta i for the i study, uh, and the assumption that Goodman's spelled out nicely there is that all of those uh, beta i's are the same. They're all equal to some beta zero. Uh, a, a less important assumption uh, that the, the noise uh, in the sigma i's is negligible. We're, we're, that's not entirely accurate, but um, it turns out it can be addressed. Um, but we'll keep that with that assumption uh, for now, that we, we essentially know the standard errors with, with perfect knowledge, or the amount of noise in them is just totally 
um, inconsequential compared to everything else that's going on in the analysis. In that particular situation, uh, then uh, a fairly obvious, and it turns out optimal, uh, estimate is a thing called the inverse variance weighted or precision weighted average, which will be familiar to anyone who's ever seen a meta-analysis before. Uh, it's this thing that I'm calling today beta hat f, uh, and it's a weighted average of, of the beta hat i's, uh, where the weights are proportional to 1 divided by uh, sigma i squared, uh, the reciprocal of the, uh, the, the variance uh, of those estimates, or known as the inverse variance or precision weighted average. Uh, it's just a simple uh, linear combination of the of the beta i's, and as I said, we're we're assuming that we know the sigmas uh, with um, essentially complete knowledge. So the, the variance of that uh, estimate can be worked out very straightforwardly, and it's got this um, uh, formula that you see in the bottom right hand uh, there of, of slide three, um, which also involves the inverses of of, of, the, of the variances. So that's all a very straightforward exercise in in, in linear algebra uh, to show that. Um, however. So there's nothing wrong with that except the assumption at the start uh, that the, the beta i's are all exactly the same. The underlying parameters are all exactly the same. That's um, silly in, in, in practice because the, the effects aren't identical. If we had lots and lots of data, we wouldn't expect uh, to see estimates that were the same in, in all of the studies. And that's for um, entirely practical reasons. The studies are done in different environments. Uh, people's adherence to whether they took the zinc versus the placebo when they were told to, say, uh, could differ uh, between uh, studies uh, fairly straightforwardly, depending on the population in which you did uh, the study, and that can be expected to differ across different trials. In, in my applied work, which I'm not a clinical trialist, I do uh, lots and lots of meta-analysis for uh, putting together genetic association effects from different studies, uh, then the patterns of genetic ancestry uh, vary, the linguistic disequilibrium varies uh, between different populations in who we do genetic studies, so the same genetic variants uh, would not be expected to have exactly the same association uh, in, in different studies. So um, that assumption of, of exact homogeneity is in most practical situations um, really a, a mathematical nicety. In practice, we'd expect to see some difference um, in, in the underlying study effects. And perhaps an exception to that is if you're doing, uh, say, lab-based, uh, very controlled experiments, uh, and you have exactly the same exactly the same strain of mice or rats or uh, whatever animal you're working on, say, uh, and you keep them in exactly the same conditions, and you come back tomorrow to replicate the experiment. It's exactly the same. Um, then you're matter analyzing those two sets of data together, then the assumption might be reasonable. But most times in practice, in complex diseases, in, in work on humans, say, then uh, it's it's not uh, a realistic assumption to make. So that's a, a problem with it. However, um, we didn't actually use it in uh, what we were we were doing with the the, the algebra, if you like, uh, in in the, the statements of the the average uh, estimate. And, and the variance. If um, those beta i hats are all normal with some underlying uh, means beta i's and, and known standard error sigma i's, um, then we can still define uh, that weighted average uh, of the beta i's uh, using the weights uh, where we presume we know that the sigmas with perfect knowledge. Uh, and the variance of that still drops out in exactly the same way. There's, there's nothing to change there. That's the, the same linear algebra goes through uh, exactly, and uh, that uh, beta f that statistic does have the variance that, that was previously indicated. So in that sense, there's nothing statistically wrong uh, with using it even in the presence of uh, heterogeneity. Uh, and as I've said in the box at the bottom of slide four, then the fixed effects uh, plural estimate uh, provides a valid statistical inference on an average of, of the beta i's, uh, regardless of their homogeneity or heterogeneity. Even if those beta i's aren't all the same, uh, then we're still learning about something in a statistically valid way um, regardless. So, um, having thought about um, that statement, then then we need to think a little bit more uh, about what it is that, that we're estimating. Uh, and that's what I'm going to consider in the, in the next few slides here with, with some pictures. This is some possible data from, from three studies, just because it makes the pictures easier uh, to, to think about, um, where we have three uh, clinical trials, uh, and we've got 200 people uh, in, in each. In each, there's a, a zinc. We've got some green people, some orange people, and some sort of purple people on, on the far end. Uh, and um, we've got 100 people taking zinc uh, versus 100 people taking placebo in the first study. Um, and um, they might have some uh, difference in means indicated by the, uh, the little arrow there. 
uh, beta 1 hat. Uh, it's a bigger difference in the second study. Uh, there seems to be uh, more of an effect, or at least a larger effect estimate uh, in the second study. Uh, and in the third study, then there's a, a different uh, beta hat, beta hat 3 there. Also, however, note that the, uh, the spread of the data is, is different. Uh, the most spread out in the, uh, in the first, in, in the green study, in the orange study, then they're um, not quite as spread out, and they're really quite compact, uh, much less diffuse. Uh, in, in the third study, in the purple study on the right-hand side there. So um, as well as learning about uh, the uh, the overall mean difference, the beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 parameters, then we learn about the, um, the amount of information which each observation gives us about the corresponding beta hat estimate. Um, so there's uh, less information in, in the green people per, per unit observation uh, and more in the purple people on, on the right-hand side. So there are some parameters um, that, that govern those. Uh, and we could think about those, the corresponding populations might look something uh, like these, uh, these violin plots. These are intended to uh, indicate what would happen in the population from which we have sampled uh, that data. So in a population, there's, there's an infinite amount of data, um, and there is some underlying mean difference parameter, so no hats anymore because we're talking about the, the populations. There's beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3 in the green, orange, and, and purple uh, populations. And uh, But there's also a difference in, in spread. So we've got some information that I'll call phi 1, phi 2, and, and phi 3. Um, and uh, there's uh, lots of information per unit observation uh, in the third population, not so much in, in, in the first one. So those are the population parameters that, that we might want to, to think about. One overall population that we could learn about um, by doing a meta-analysis uh, and, and getting a single estimate out from it uh, is um, very straightforwardly what you get just putting all together, putting together all the, the zinc-taking people outcomes and, and the placebo-taking uh, outcomes. And then there would be an average in the zinc group and an average in the placebo group, uh, and you could um, uh, take the difference between those and then call it, I'll call it beta combine here, uh, and that's what you get if each of those populations were weighted equally. Really, we've just gone from, from this picture to this picture with these um, violin plots and, and, and moved them around. The violin plots, the sort of Christmas tree ornament shaped things, I uh, just slid them around. It's the same picture uh, and, and comparing the averages in, in the two groups. So that's a, an overall population that it, it's easy to think about, but it's not the only one we could uh, we could learn about from this data. Here's another one. Uh, this is a population where the orange people are proportionally a larger part of that overall population. And so I've inflated the width there uh, of their Christmas tree ornaments, of their violin plots. Um, everything else is, is kept the same. Beta 2 is, is the same. The amount of information uh, per unit observation is the same. Just that we're, we're giving more weight uh, to those uh, orange people, less to the green, less to the purple. Um, and then you can play the same game of sliding around the, the Christmas tree ornaments. Uh, and, and get a, a, a beta combined uh, parameter that reflects the uh, overall difference in zinc uh, versus placebo uh, in that uh, weighted uh, population, uh, if you like, that, that's, that's more orange than it is green or, or purple. Um, so there's still a, an average effect over that population comparing zinc to placebo, but now it's closer to what's going on. It pays more attention to what's going on uh, in the orange group than, than the purple group or the zero or, or the purple sorry, the green or the purple groups. Uh, so uh, the beta combined that you get uh, from uh, this population is closer to beta 2, the, the orange mean difference, uh, than, than the previous example. Uh, and of course, you could play this game if you want to upweight the green people, then their violin bots get uh, wider and the other ones get skinnier, uh, and you can uh, shuffle them around and uh, get a mean difference that's now closer to, to beta 1, um, as indicated on, on this graph here. And uh, there are unlim unlimited uh, possibilities of, of how these uh, individual populations could be weighted in an overall population. So what might be a good choice? Well, uh, it seems reasonable, uh, I think, to argue that uh, upweighting studies which are larger makes more sense because we know more about what's going on uh, in their uh, uh, for, for their individual parameters. Also, and similarly, it makes more sense to upweight studies that are more informative about their corresponding parameters. Um, and um, one way to do that is to um, estimate a, a parameter, which is I'll call beta f, uh, and it's a weighted average of all the beta i's. Uh, and 
uh, how am I weighting it? Well, uh, I'm weighting it with uh, proportion eta, uh, which is going to be proportional to the uh, uh, original sample size, um, and uh, weights proportional to, to phi uh, for the individual study. So that's the information parameter um, that um, describes the amount of information about uh, beta per unit observation. Uh, and of course, under the assumptions that uh, we know the uh, the sigmas, then uh, eta and, and phi are proportional to uh, 1 over uh, sigma i squared. So th this beta f uh, parameter is just uh, the same sort of weighted average that we were seeing before uh, with the uh, inverse variance weights. And so we could estimate that uh, by beta hat f, um, and that would have the variance that, that we saw before uh, under the assumptions uh, that we saw before that there's a beta i in each study um, and that. Uh, the central limit theorem governs the, the normal distribution of uh, the corresponding estimate to beta hat i. So um, beta hat f uh, then is the precision uh, weighted average, the same thing that we saw before, the fixed effects estimator, uh, and, and uh, the plural there. It's estimating uh, beta half, we, beta f, which we can think of, if, if you like, as, as a fixed effects average parameter. That's what's being estimated. Uh, it's that particular weighted average of the study-specific uh, estimates uh, beta i, uh, where the weights are proportional to both the sample size and the amount of information that you get per observation there. So you, you pay more attention to the larger and more informative studies, and you pay less attention to the smaller and less informative studies. Um, you can prove my math mathematical results about that. You can prove consistency. Um, if, if you want to, um, when if you're looking in a population that looks much like the data that you have, uh, then uh, you get consistency, uh, and you get all. Uh, uh, but that probably that, that variance uh, property is the one that's uh, most important in practice. Um, so we developed uh, this interpretation of the uh, beta hat f estimate, regardless of homogeneity or heterogeneity. Uh, we didn't need uh, homogeneity or heterogeneity uh, to. Set to um, say what the distribution was, to get the variance out, uh, or, or even to define uh, the parameter that we're estimating. Uh, we haven't said that the beta i's are all the same. Uh, we just said that we're interested in a particular weighted average of them uh, and a, a sensible uh, weighted average there. Uh, it can also be motivated, it turns out, by being the, uh, it's the weighted average that's most easy to estimate, uh, that it's, it's got the smallest variance uh, amongst uh, all weighted averages of, of the beta hat i, as it turns out, that's, that's another way to, to motivate it, um, that, it uh, that we describe it a little bit more uh, elsewhere. Uh, but just paying attention to, to the larger and more informative studies seems a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, that, that bullet point at the bottom uh, saying that uh, tests for heterogeneity, worrying about heterogeneity is not required to use that with this, this interpretation of the fixed effects average is, is I think, new to uh, people, and I would like to um, talk a little bit more uh, about that, because um, there's many users out there who've only seen the, the fixed effect singular motivation, the, the Steve Goodman quote, if, if you like, um, and they tend to use it as the only reason for ever using uh, beta hat f. If you see that fixed effects estimate uh, in, in a paper, then, then many people will jump to the conclusion that you've assumed that the effects are all the same. And, and this doesn't make sense, because I just showed you another interpretation of uh, what that parameter is estimating, and it didn't use the, that assumption. Um, and my favorite analogy at the moment for this is that um, if I see you in, in a supermarket picking eggs off the shelf and, and, and buying them, um, I can't necessarily jump to the conclusion that you're going to make an omelet. It does work the other way around. If, I, if you made me an omelet, and thank you for doing so because it's breakfast time here, um, that, um, that uh, you must have bought some eggs in order to do that. Okay, that, that, that's reasonable. But going the other way, um, uh, assuming that there's uh, an assumption of, of homogeneity because we have computed uh, beta hat f, uh, doesn't make sense. Uh, okay, five so, more minutes, is that okay? That's great. Yeah, thanks. So, so uh, the basic ideas here aren't new. Um, the, the, uh, the same average effect argument, just you know, paying attention to more informative um, subtables, it turns out, uh, motivates the mantle heinzel estimate, which has been around for ages. Um, and uh, this uh, fixed effects in the plural argument was also presented way back in, in the 80s and 90s uh, by uh, Larry Hedges has put it various places, including the Handbook of Research Synthesis, which I think has a very nice explanation of it. Um, we can also extend it, uh, which I'll, I'll skip the bullet points at the bottom of slide 13 there. Um, 
on slide 14, we, we all know about the, the flaw of averages. And, and if we're just estimating some average uh, effect, which is what uh, beta hat f is, uh, as I've argued, telling us about, then, then what other questions could we answer? Uh, if you can drown in a river that's of average three feet deep, then just knowing the, uh, the, depth, the average depth of the river isn't actually very it isn't the only story uh, that you could tell with, with that data, uh, you can, uh, as, as indicated here. Uh, so uh, I won't go into it in detail, but uh, you can extend the same ideas to have uh, a weighted variance, not just a weighted mean. And that gets a parameter that we're calling uh, zeta squared uh, here. Um, and uh, empirically estimating, you get a, 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 an estimate that's uh, basically a scaled uh, version of, um, a shifted and scaled version of Cochrane's Q. Uh, it's closely related to I squared. Uh, uh, the standard measure of uh, heterogeneity uh, as well. So you get as, as a weighted uh, variance in the same way that it was a weighted average. You see the same sort of weights uh, appearing there. Uh, it's a weighted stand uh, the weighted standard deviation zeta is measured on the same scale as all the betas. So it's a nice measure of scale that you can say how different things are on, on the original scale. Um, and it's um, it turns out its inference is, is far more stable uh, than the usual measures of uh, heterogeneity that you'd get from um, random effects distributions type of approaches. Um, and um, there's lots of algebra here that I won't go through, but meta-regression could be motivated in the same way. Uh, meta-regression is, it turns out, just a, a weighted average of how far the beta i hats are from their fixed effects average, weighted by ways which include the, the, the the um, inverse variance weights that we saw before, but also how discrepant uh, a study is from uh, a weighted average of covariate uh, values. Uh, I've called the covariate x here. And so there's uh, an interpretation uh, or extension, if you like, of the same ideas to, to meta regression. There are, um, this is all just linear algebra uh, at heart. So it turns out you get the variance of um, the meta regression estimates. And for both uh, zeta squared and uh, meta regression, you can get breakdowns of the overall variance into components that are due to um, you know, different, uh, difference of, of beta f from zero, and then difference of, a, of, a, of this meta regression slope uh, from zero uh, as, as well. So uh, there's some elegant results that uh, fall out there, which are, are mentioned uh, in the full paper. So uh, to, to wrap up then, um, I just want to uh, show you a picture of, of the assumptions so you can see that they're different uh, in the common effect uh, model, then we assume everything's the same. Um, and sure, we can do inference there, but it's rarely plausible. Of course, it's the fixed effects analysis, uh, fixed effects model, which has just different effect sizes for all the different studies. They're completely unrestricted, um, which is uh, really essentially no assumption at all. Uh, there's just a, a different uh, effect size in, in each study. That's a, a very, very weak uh, assumption. Uh, we're estimating a sensible average of them rather than just the one true value. Uh, but we can get valid inference. Uh, we can get, it turns out, valid inference in, in smaller studies as, as well. Uh, we can estimate heterogeneity and do meta regression and all these extensions and things where you can't really do that with the, the common effect model because there's you've already assumed that everything's the same, so there's no uh, homogeneity to, to explore. So I'll stop there. My thanks to uh, people who've worked on this with me, uh, Thomas Lumley and Julian Higgins, uh, who wrote the, the, the main paper on that, but uh, Clara Dominguez Elias. As a student of mine uh, who's uh, been extending it in, in various different directions. Uh, and a final reminder that uh, the papers and some other material are available at that website there. And with that, I will stop uh, and hand things back to Ian and take any questions. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, it's not easy speaking when you don't have a room of people staring in rapt attention at you. For some, you, you give <laughs> I don't always get rapt attention. <laughs> Um, a room of people whose feedback you can monitor. Um, so thank you. That was really clear. And um, I'm also delighted to, to spot that we did actually have a dog barking in the background at some point. Um, so a reminder to everyone, please do, do mute your microphone if you possibly can. Um, you should see the microphone symbol with a line through it to mean you're muted. Um, it wasn't distracting at all, the dog. I was just, I was just amused. Um, so let's first turn to Dan Jackson. Dan's um, at AstraZeneca, and he's going to um, make, um, ask, sorry, he's going to introduce the discussion on Ken's paper. Dan, over to you. So, uh, thanks very much, Ian. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you good. fine. Good, good. So hopefully I've got, I've just gained control of these slides, and hopefully I can flick onto the second slide. Let's see if the text going to work. Um, yeah, hopefully you can all see the second slide now. Um, 
So first of all, let me uh, congratulate uh, Ken and the authors on, a, a, I think, a fine paper that really reminds us, reminds me, that there are, there are more than two uh, sort of flavours of meta-analysis. So I've probably been a bit brainwashed or um, stopped think, forget to think about these. I think, well, there's, there's the fixed effect and there's the random effects. And um, that, that's, that's, those are the two approaches. Now, I put a little um, quote from Shakespeare, and I'm not a Shakespeare scholar, as, as some of you will know, and I hope I've uh, quoted that correctly. Shakespeare scholars in the, in the audience can correct me. But I think it's an appropriate one, which I think this is, really, this is a really, really valuable paper, because it reminds us that there's, there's not just these two uh, versions of meta-analysis, uh, there's many more than that. And in particular, there's this, this, this um, other sort of flavour or interpretation of, of meta-analysis is often forgotten about. Uh, I do think that um, these ideas have been around for quite a well, while, as Ken says, to be fair. And I think that, um, and maybe maybe I'm wrong here, but I think the many modes of meta uh, by Stephen Sen also contains some relevant discussion into these issues. Uh, it's been a while since I've studied it carefully. I did have a look at it again, but um, I think that's um, uh, sort of ahead of its time in some ways and, and uh, has, has things to say about this. But uh, what I would like to do is try, just try and dig a little bit behind the, the ideas and behind the paper by, by trying to ask... Uh, three questions, which aren't intended to, to trip you up in any way, Ken, but try to ask you some, some, some reasonably challenging questions, I suppose, just to try and uh, delve a little bit deeper, if that's okay. So I've got, got three, if, three questions, and Ian, if I haven't got time for all three of them, by all means, uh, stop me after one or two. Is, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll see how far we get through these questions. And so question one, so we've, we've heard quite a lot that um, we're taking these variances as fixed as known. We've heard this said various different ways compared to everything else that's going on, that within sort of variance is known, assume there's no um, uncertain, and all, the, all these sorts of things. And in the paper it says uh, that these estimates have the statistical properties we have described is well known and not debated. Well, I'll say, are the authors sure? Because in, in our recent paper, when should, so a little plug for our paper here, perhaps, but uh, when should meta-analysis avoid making hidden normality assumptions? We debated this issue at length, but we, we forgot to discuss it for the fixed effects model. We only discussed it for the fixed effect and the random effects model. But um, uh, since these within study variances aren't really known, presumably these issues also apply to the fixed effects uh, uh, meta-analysis approach as well. So I just wondered if you had any comments or thoughts about that, Ken. Surely it's not immune, this isn't immune to all of this, is, is it? Do you want all to, right. should we hand back to Ken straight away to um, answer that? As you wish. How do you want to do this, or do you want to? Okay, I, I think I can give a quick answer there. Um, the, the estimates and statistical properties that we described, and I, I think we're fairly careful to say what they are, uh, is, isn't debated, as I say, it's just, just linear algebra, so, so yes, we're sure. Um, then, um, the, uh, it, when the sigma i's aren't known uh, with perfect knowledge, when the standard errors aren't known perfectly, mm -hmm. then, uh, then yes, um, then uh, things get a little bit more complicated. But uh, the short answer is I can point you to my paper on, on that, uh, which is uh, on, on the website that I, I, I linked to. Uh, and um, yes, one has to uh, incorporate an extra term in, into the variance. It turns out it's usually pretty small. Uh -huh. uh, you, you don't have to do a whole lot of, of correction. So it's not the, the biggest thing to worry about. But in some situations, it, it can matter. Uh, interestingly, the amount of extra uh, variability one has to add on is uh, takes, in part, uh, is, is larger when there's more heterogeneity between studies. Okay, yeah, that sounds fine. So I really wish in our paper we'd mentioned the fixed effects approach as well, because I'm sure a lot of what we said applies there as well. But um, Ian, do you want to throw that question open, open to the audience, or would you like me to move on to question two? I think you should move on to question two, okay. please, Dan. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, the one little sort of concern I have about this fixed effects approach is how meaningful the resulting parameter is, because um, I, I feel as though with the fixed effect approach and with the random effects approach, I know what this overall pooled estimate, this mu or b overall beta, whatever we're calling it, represents. But for a fixed effects model, yes, so I agree that um, it's, it's, it's great, actually. It's another way of justifying the, the, the estimate and standard error that I'm used to seeing from the fixed effect, or, or perhaps I should call it the common effect model. But I just wonder exactly what this, this, what, what this parameter I'm estimating means, because it, it seems to me like a, a really rather strange uh, linear combination of the, the treatment effects that's in front of me. And I sometimes wonder, I'm not, not overly... I sometimes wonder what happens if I introduce uh, 
uh, another study. So suppose I've done my meta-analysis, I think you had three studies in your examples. If, if a fourth study comes along, then the, the, beta, the beta that we're estimating, it's a, it's a weighted average of the studies in front of me. So if a fourth study comes along, all of a sudden it's a weighted average of four studies, and it's the four studies in front of me. So presumably now, strictly speaking, trying to get slightly philosophical, that the meaning of the parameter has changed because I've got a fourth study now, which makes me a little bit worried and a little bit uncertain as to what this... Uh, this, how to interpret this um, this estimate under the fixed effects model? I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this as well for me, Ken. So I, I struggle with this. Um, there we can help then. Uh, that, first of all, yes, the the the, the thing you'd be estimating does uh, change when when, when a fourth study uh -huh. comes along. Uh -huh. um, but um, our goal here is to get people to think about what it is they're estimating when when they when they've you know, got all the studies in front of them. Uh, and which population they're making inference about. Uh, it's something I didn't talk about, it's briefly mentioned in the slide, but it, it might reassure people that there's a close connection between the, the beta f parameter uh, that we're estimating and what you would get uh, if you pull all the data together and run a run analysis of, say, zinc versus placebo that adjusted for study, uh, importantly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that gives you a, a, an overall weighted average of what's going on in, in all the different studies. You've just pulled them all together in, in one analysis. Uh, and so the, the effect that you'd estimate there is the same thing, essentially, that you're getting uh, from, from the meta-analysis. So that um, often helps, uh, I think, uh, people to, uh, to allow for the, uh, the, uh, the, the different studies that are, that are going on there. Okay. So just to check, I think you said so. When a new study does come in, we agree the parameter, the meaning of the parameter, strictly speaking, does change. We do, we do agree on that, do we? Strictly speaking. Yes, the parameter that you're being estimated depends on on, on the data that, that you're putting in. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's something I would think the meta-analysis should, should think about if that's uh, that's something we're comfortable with. But at least that, that that's reassuring for me because I think in that case I think I understand it. So in, in that in, in that case, let me just ask my, ask my, my final question. Actually, we've corresponded. Well, Dan, so. actually, you, you invited me to. to oh, sorry. You off, so. <laughs> yeah. I, I want, could I just come in on that question too? Because I, I I thought that was that was really key to this. So you know, suppose we're actually trying to use a meta-analysis to make a policy decision. And suppose we look at our meta-analysis and we see that some of the studies in the meta-analysis are a bit more relevant to our setting than other of the studies. Um, well, how does that relate to your approach, Ken? Does that, well, that help um, you to define the weights or what? Yes, uh, and, and we get to this in an appendix to, to the paper. It wasn't in the talk. But uh, if, if that weighted average doesn't seem to be particularly relevant, um, that it, you know, you're know you doing a study in, uh, you've got lots and lots of data from men saying you're interested in something that's got equal weights between men and women, uh, then um, sure, then the overall weighted average that you're getting from fixed effects meta-analysis probably isn't the most relevant thing. Uh, and some other form of weights could be used, um, probably, uh, in, in that situation. So we talk about that in one of the appendices uh, in, in, in the paper that um, really our, our, our goal for the, the, the first part when just describing what the fixed effects, the standard fixed effects analysis is to say, you know, here's the population that you're learning about and think about that population and, and is it relevant or not? Uh, and sometimes it is, often it is, uh, and sometimes it's not, and, and then alternatives can be considered. And there's a question from um, Mark in the conversation. He says, in an in example in slide two, did you prefer yep. the fixed or the random effect overall estimate? Um, I don't have a strong opinion. As I mentioned, I'm not a clinical trialist, so I don't have a strong uh, uh, preference there. For testing, um, then just testing if there's some overall effect of, of zinc plus versus placebo, um, then I, I think probably the, the fixed effects uh, analysis is, is preferable there. Um, you get a, a little bit more power uh, to detect um, overall effects in, in most circumstances. Uh, to expand on that slightly, in, in my sort of day job with uh, uh, large-scale genetic analyses, putting together uh, studies by meta-analysis, which is, is the standard procedure there, then fixed effects analysis, because we're primarily interested in testing the so-called strong null hypothesis that there's no effect in any population, uh, fixed effects analysis is uh, a very good default there, and, and it is the standard tool. Random effects analysis isn't uh, used in those situations. Um, if you want to do prediction of a new study, then random effects is, is perhaps a bit more appealing. But um, for analysis that's centered around testing, then, then fixed effects is, uh, I think, a good default. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, please feel free, everyone, to put, to put more questions in. Um, James, you were our other 
discuss them. Did you did you have something you wanted to say at this point? I, I yes, I I just wondered if you wanted to follow up on that, Ken, and and where does this leave random effects? Um, I mean, obviously, it's another average one that pays more attention to the smaller studies. Does that mean it's it's generally um, obviously it doesn't have quite the optimality properties that you you highlighted with the fixed effects? Sh should we uh, generally be moving away from it? Do you think, or is that too strong? Uh, I think it is a good idea to to move away from the idea that you have to. Yeah, and some textbooks recommend this uh, uh, testing for heterogeneity. And if you see significant heterogeneity, then then do the random effects. Otherwise, do the fixed effects. I don't think that's very good advice. Um, random effects analysis, um, I think, does have a place. That we uh, I talked earlier about uh, prediction of a new study, and it, it's great for doing that. It makes a lot of sense to do that there. Uh, also, I, I like the. Um, the idea of motivating it through a statement of exchangeability uh, different studies in, in a Bayesian analysis, which makes a lot of sense. And I'll point people to uh, Julian Higgins and David Spiegelhalter's GRSSA paper on that from a few years ago. It's cited in, in our paper. Um, uh, so, and that exchangeability assumption uh, is, is of interest there. Um, so the, the assumptions behind uh, random effects analysis, are, I think, uh, are reasonable. But um, the, the overall weighted average that it gives you is probably of less interest, uh, less importance than it perhaps receives in, in the literature. Um, I, I, I can see what you're driving at. It, it doesn't yeah. sound in, entirely satisfactory because, um, say, so the point of the analysis is to get an effect. If, if, you, if you believe that the fixed effect uh, or fixed effects uh, estimate is, is the right one, then basically you're saying that you, you don't believe in the exchangeability assumption for the, in terms of estimating an effect. Is that right? Um, no, it, it turns out you can have both. Uh, you can make the exchangeability uh, assumption and still estimate uh, beta f. Um, and we have a paper under review that, that describes uh, doing that. Um, and it turns out it's a, it, it's a good thing to do. It has uh, good statistical properties that I, I won't get into here. Um, but so you can still have that, that exchangeability assumption uh, and estimate uh, B to F. The uh, random effects um, weighted average that you described, the thing that a Dersimony and Laird type analysis might get you, uh, I find harder to motivate in, in general. Why is it that you should sort of fudge around the weights a bit uh, and add a sort of fudge factor there? Um, it's um, the, the, the idea that the studies are sampled at random from some population of studies is pretty implausible. Uh, in, in practice, and so the mean and variance of that population aren't of direct interest in most situations. So we're beginning to run out of time for this part of, of the webinar. I just wondered whether anyone um, online has anything um, to say. I, I can see a couple of questions. Does anybody want to actually ask a question? In, um, speaking, um, I've seen questions from Ilan Joshi and Hussein. As if you want, shall I, shall I read something out, or would, would either of you like to say something? Okay, so um, I think that my reading of, of the conversation is that this idea of distinct effects in different studies is, is being found quite confusing by some people. Ken, what, how does it differ? And I think you've given an answer previously. What, what's the difference between different things and random things? Um, would you like to come back on that, Ken? Sure. Um, so different things and random things. Uh, different things are just different. There's a fixed effect, fixed effect, singular, in, in each study, uh, and we estimate some average of them. Uh, random effects is, is, is um, as, well, as we talked about already, there's a couple of ways of motivating it. But um, the, the most common one, I think, is that saying that there are different draws from some population, saying that um, if you knew what's happening in lots and lots of studies, you'd have a better idea of what's happening in the next one that comes along randomly. Um, with the fixed effects assumption, that you don't get that, um, and so um, th th you don't learn about the, the next uh, study that, that might come along. Um, you don't really get to, to make predictions uh, in a particularly useful way um, uh, about the next study that, that, that comes along. Uh, random effects uh, do that. If you assume that the study effects are coming from some population of study effects and there's a normal distribution and we've learned about it, its mean and variance from the studies that we've got, uh, then you can make a prediction about the next one. Um, and random effects is, is good for that. Uh, but um, the fixed effects doesn't uh, provide that. So that's, that's one difference. 
So we're assuming different constants uh, in the different studies in fixed effects, and there are draws from a single population in, in random effects. Okay. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, I've no idea how we give you a round of applause on a webinar. Um, <laughs> you don't need to. We could, all, we could all thumb our screens or something like that. Um, <laughs> so consider yourself to have had a round of applause. Um, what I'm taking away from this really is that yes, somebody's clapped on the on the conversation. Good. Um, what I'm taking away from this um, is that really, as soon as we stop believing we have homogeneity of effects, we have to actually worry about what we really, really want to estimate, what our target parameter is, or I suppose what our estimand is. As people, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, is probably getting used to using using that word. Um, and that sort of leads us indirectly onto our next speaker, who is from the pharmaceutical industry, although not talking about estimands. Um, so we next have Natalie Dimier. So she is a principal statistical scientist at Roche, um, and she's going to talk. And I'm sorry, Natalie, it's, it's a rather long title. Um, she's going to talk about surrogate endpoints. So Natalie, over to you. Thank you very much um, for the invitation and, and for the introduction. So um, I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about an investigation that I worked on with uh, Sue, Sue Todd. Um, so very much uh, thanks to Sue. I don't know whether she was able to join today, but um, certainly a joint effort. And what we uh, really set out to do with this was to assess an existing methodology um, in practice for the use of um, evaluating time to event surrogate endpoints for time to event um, kind of true endpoints. So I'll go through the, the terminology. Um, but really, over the course of the next 20 minutes, I would just like to talk on the context um, for why we wanted to, to look into this. Um, really, the key motivations for doing what we did. Um, so we had two uh, primary motivations. And then how we went about it, so the investigation, the kind of things that we were interested to evaluate, um, and then the results of what we had done. Um, and then I'll touch on conclusions of that and critically some remaining questions. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to answer everything, so we have outstanding questions um, and, of course, input is welcome from everybody. Um, so this, uh, this research really came from my, uh, my PhD, where I was interested in evaluating surrogate endpoints from a, an individual pharmaceutical company perspective. Um, so if I'm sitting and I'm trying to design my phase three trial, I've got information from phase one and phase two studies, um, but I'm trying to really figure out what I'm going to do uh, next and how I'm going to design my phase three trial. Um, and knowing really the I say still lengthy process of, uh, of running phase three clinical trials, really thinking about how we can make those trials as efficient as possible. Um, and certainly the key drivers for uh, the length, the duration, the complexity of phase three clinical trials is the choice of our primary endpoint. Um, so particularly in settings where the primary endpoint is driven by the time to some kind of event, be it a disease progression, uh, a death or, or some kind of response endpoint, really, as we're seeing improved patient outcomes, we're seeing that time to run these trials with these traditional endpoints is getting increasingly, increasingly difficult, um, and it's, of course, associated with higher trial costs. Um, so surrogate endpoints are something that have been proposed uh, many times. They've been used multiple times in practice. Uh, really to allow us to redefine how we would confirm clinical benefits in a phase three trial and therefore make uh, treatments available quicker. Um, so according to the, the FDA um, uh, act that's quoted on the screen now, so there are two types of uh, surrogate marker or surrogate endpoint that are currently defined, um, at least by the US uh, regulatory authorities. Um, there are those that are known to predict clinical benefits um, and those are endpoints that are essentially sufficient for the FDA to be able to provide full approval for um, a new uh, medicinal product. And then there's a category that are not quite there. They are endpoints that are considered reasonably likely to predict benefit, and those would be used for accelerated approval with uh, further data being based on a kind of long-term, more traditional endpoint. Um, so. What comes from, from this, the difference between the applicability of these endpoints is really whether they're known to predict clinical benefits or they're not known, but they're considered reasonably likely. 
And so we need to have measures of how predictive a surrogate endpoint can be for some long term or true um, endpoint of interest. And so really important is the two levels of surrogacy. Um, so individual level surrogacy, which is on a patient level. So if you have an outcome on a surrogate endpoint, for example, a response, then how does that change your long term prognosis? So is a responding patient more likely to have a long term survival, for example? And then there's a trial level surrogacy, which is more of the study population level. Um, and this is the related to the treatment effects on those two endpoints. So regulatory decision making is based on a treatment effect that is observed on a primary endpoint. So it's about evaluating how well a treatment effect on the surrogate would predict a treatment effect on a long term true outcome, um, which eventually would not be observed if the surrogate was used in practice. So the FDA, I follow on a theme with the FDA just because there have been quite a few recent actions um, that really are, I would say, encouraging the use of surrogates um, where appropriate. So recently, this year, um, FDA have published on their website a table of all surrogate endpoints that have been used as a basis for approval. So uh, not just the, the endpoint, but the disease setting, the patient population, and also whether that endpoint was considered for traditional or accelerated approval. Um, they've also proposed use of type C meetings with sponsors to discuss uh, use of surrogate endpoints that have never been used before, uh, and also hosted a workshop on defining an evidentiary framework for surrogate endpoint evaluation. So there's really a lot more, uh, I would say, engagement from the regulatory authorities um, on the use of surrogate endpoints. So this is it's really encouraging, and it's really um, kind of where we, we want to move towards. Um, but the question is why I'm discussing this in a session on meta-analysis. Um, and this is really uh, a kind of evolution over time. So the original ideas for evaluating surrogate endpoints um, sort of two decades ago and more were very much focused on individual trial uh, results. So how well results have correlated between surrogates and long-term endpoints within individual studies. But it was very quickly um, kind of recommended that this should be developed into meta-analytical approaches and really to increase accuracy of the evaluation, increase uh, precision in the prediction, um, assessing consistency of this relationship between treatment effects across different trials where you might have different patient populations, different treatment classes, mechanisms of action, um, and, and a variety of other um, factors that might impact the use of that surrogate in the future. Um, and of course, extrapolating to new treatments that are currently not available is also something that, um, that is very challenging um, to do. Um, so in practice, um, there's a lot of considerations uh, before conducting a meta-analysis of a surrogate endpoint um, is really how do we define what should be in that meta-analysis? Is it every single trial that's ever been developed or, or run within a certain patient population? Is it only certain subsets of patient population? Um, and how do you define the surrogate endpoint that will be applicable in the future? Maybe it's going to be different across different patient populations or for different treatments. And is it reasonable to pool everything that you have, all available data, or does it need to be kind of conducted in, in individual settings? So there's a lot of really critical factors that need to be taken into account for, for the evaluation of a surrogate um, for, for future development. Um, so the, the methodology that we were interested in looking at um, was that of Thomas Berzikowski, um, which really is a development based on earlier methods for continuous endpoints, um, now developed for a variety of different endpoint types, but really interested here in uh, time to event surrogates and time to event true endpoints. Um, and essentially the methodology, I won't go into detail, but uh, it, it essentially develops uh, or defines a joint distribution between those two endpoints in order to estimate the two parameters that I uh, mentioned before. So the individual level surrogacy, which is uh, association between the two endpoints at the patient level after you've adjusted for trial and treatment effects. And then the trial level surrogacy, which is the, the coefficient of determination for predicting the effect of treatment on your long-term outcome 
um, given the uh, treatment effect on the surrogate outcome. Of course, um, in a, a future trial where the surrogate is used, you only have the treatment effects on the surrogate observed um, to make regulatory decisions. Um, so the method is split into two stages. Uh, the first stage is estimating the treatment effects on those two endpoints uh, for every trial and estimating the association between the outcomes and then using a, a, a random effects model um, of those estimated treatment effects from the first stage to um, evaluate how well the, the surrogate can predict um, the, the treatment effect on that true endpoint. The, the motivations, so the, the, the graphics are quite small here, you um, don't need to see the detail of them. I think the, the main point I want to make here is the uh, number of trials that would be included in any such analysis. So really critical to evaluating a surrogate endpoint is having sufficient data from a variety of different settings that would be representative of how that surrogate endpoint might be used in the future. Um, an extrapolation of results from that meta-analysis is, is really dependent on having a good understanding of how the surrogacy relationship might differ across different treatment regimen, different therapeutic classes, different subgroups of, of patients. And very recent examples of where this has been successful are studies or meta-analyses where there are a large number of trials available. So these examples here um, in three uh, different diseases have, you know, between 13 and 18 large randomized phase three clinical trials available to do this meta-analysis. So really a wealth of data being included. But if I return back to the context that I'm interested in, which is me sat at my desk, trying to design my phase three study and trying to decide what clinical trial endpoint is appropriate, I, I don't have this much information available. I have my phase one and phase two studies, um, and that, that's that's pretty much it um, in terms of having patient level data. So I was really interested to understand whether this methodology would perform well with, with having very small numbers of trials. The second motivation um, was something that was perhaps a little bit more fundamental, which was around uh, the assumptions of the modeling approach used in this particular methodology. So the forming of the joint distribution between the surrogate and the true endpoints um, assumes that those two endpoints are symmetric, um, so that one cannot be longer than the other. Um, quite often in oncology and other disease areas, your kind of long-term endpoint of interest is survival. And uh, there are many endpoints that cannot be longer than survival. Um, but we quite often use uh, what I call composite endpoints. So they might be um, endpoints that combine multiple events of interest, so disease progression or disease response uh, with a time to death, for example. Um, and really, we use these endpoints to, to try and maximize the clinical relevance of results by having as many of uh, that kind of true long-term outcome of interest as possible. Um, they maximize the number of events and, and de decrease trial durations. So one example might be um, progression-free survival that we use commonly in oncology, uh, which is defined as the time to the earliest of either disease progression or death. So this endpoint includes information relating to overall survival, which would traditionally be our kind of phase three primary endpoint. Um, and there'll be other areas where such a similar setting happens. For example, in cardiovascular disease, there might be multiple events of interest for your, your proposed surrogate endpoint. So I was interested, again, to, to see how this kind of setup where we have event data from the true clinical outcome kind of mixed in with the definition of the surrogate endpoint and see what uh, impact that would have on the, the results. So we set this up, as I say, with a, a number of um, scenarios that we were interested to evaluate. So we considered two different surrogate endpoints, um, one being time to progression um, defined as time from randomization into study to disease progression only. Um, whereby patients would be censored for that endpoint if they um, had an event of death prior to disease progression, and then to assess the impact of, of inclusion of, of the death information, um, the second surrogate endpoint we considered was progression-free survival, which included death as an event. Um, and both of those were considered as surrogates for a true endpoint of overall survival. Um, the small number of trials that we were considering, so essentially looking at between four and six trials, small trials randomized, but um, small number of trials 
with fairly small sample sizes of just 80 to 120 patients. Um, and then we also looked at um, two different ways of simulating the data to kind of allow for a correct model specification and a, a model misspecification. Um, and the way that we did this was to use two different copula functions to generate the data and use one of those copula functions in the model fit to be able to assess how sensitive that model fit would be to the, the kind of underlying dependency um, structure. So I talk first about the individual level um, surrogacy results. So um, on the left two, uh, two plots, so under the heading of time to progression, we've got in this top left corner the kind of um, perfect model, if you like, uh, where the, the copula used to generate the data is the same as the copula that's used to fit. And then underneath, we start to change how the data is simulated, um, but use the same copula in the model fit just to see how sensitive that is to the underlying dependence. And then we have the same on the right hand side, but for progression free survival. So you can see on the, the top left corner, so this is where the model used to generate the data and fit to the data um, is the same as the Clayton, um, and where we haven't got any kind of violation of that symmetry assumption. Um, and it's fairly encouraging. I mean, we have very small uh, numbers of trials, small numbers of patients, so we expect variability. And the three boxes uh, represent different levels of censoring, so from 0% up to 60% censoring on that overall survival endpoint. But I think the overall distribution um, is, is fairly, um, I would say, good. Um, there's some variability, as I say, as censoring increases, but across that increasing individual level surrogacy, we do see clear separation, um, regardless of the censoring level, and it's very clear that we're, we're seeing um, pretty reasonable estimation. When you change the uh, scenario to be the kind of uh, misspecified model, if you will. So we've got a different dependence structure in the simulated data. Although we see the increase, you can see there's, there's certainly not the clear separation of the three levels of uh, surrogacy that were input into the simulation, which was 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0.8. But you do still see the, the gradual increase, although there is now overlap, uh, with the particularly with the ranges under censoring. So we start to see some deterioration, but generally you see as the true underlying surrogacy uh, increases, so do the estimates um, of, of that value. When it comes to PFS, um, so in the top right corner, so again, we're looking at the perfect model in that the Clayton copula was used for the simulation and for the model fit. Um, you start to see this issue at the very low levels. So these three boxes on the left here, this is the very low level of surrogacy um, that was fed into the simulation, um, 0.2. And you can see that the estimates then suddenly are much higher, um, of course, due to the inclusion of the overall survival information in that model. Um, and we start to see this issue of overlap, not just with the, the censoring, but across the different levels. So this true level of surrogacy of 0.2 actually can be estimated up as high as 0.7. So very, very much higher um, than, than the input value would be. Um, and the same pattern happens when you think about the model misspecification. So um, the increase is there, but you start to get much more of an overlap between levels with uh, true surrogacy of 0.2. Uh, being estimated as higher than um, than true surrogacy of 0.5, um, obviously due to the variation to the sensory. So certainly some, some question marks as to um, how much impact this would have on your interpretation. When it comes to trial level surrogacy, um, and I show results here just for the Clayton uh, copula and the, the, the other copula function, the results were very, very similar. But um, regardless of whether you're looking at time to progression on the left-hand side or progression-free survival on the right-hand side, um, there really is, uh, I, I would say, fairly poor um, estimation of that surrogacy due to the, the small numbers of trials. Um, so this, this display, I believe, is six trials. Um, so there's, there's a slight trend upwards um, as the true uh, underlying value uh, increases. I think it's, it's perhaps the clarity is not quite there on the presentation, but we go from 0.2 to 0.5 to 0.8. So there is a, a kind of increase, but of course the variability is, is very, very large, and um, the range of estimates covers the entire unit interval, so not to be uh, relied on for such small sample sizes. Um, we did look at this for much larger sample sizes, so with 20 trials of 500 patients, and of course it looked um, far, far better, but certainly for the, 
for the size or the number of studies, I should say, investigated here between four and six, there's, there's no clear interpretation um, possible from, from those results. So the conclusions of, of the investigation really were that um, the model or the method does perform, perform well, um, even with these low sample sizes um, and low numbers of trials, when you have a time to progression endpoint, so you don't have this symmetry violation. Um, but when you start to include information from that true endpoint, that long-term endpoint in your surrogate, then you do start to see, potentially as you would expect, um, some overestimation of that relationship between endpoints. And I suspect this will be very much related to the disease pathway. It will be related to the proportion of events in your surrogate that are due to your, your final endpoints, um, all of those likely to, to have an impact on how much that is overestimated. Um, but the really critical piece, I think, is the, the need for really careful selection, um, not just of the copula family, but also the shape of that dependence um, between the surrogate and the true endpoints. So not just the direction, but the strength and the shape of how those two are related. So is it early event times, perhaps, that have stronger correlation? Or is it later event times? Um, but certainly, you see the difference when you start to have a, a misspecified model. Um, with the limited numbers of trials, uh, so between four and six, it's, it's difficult to be able to recommend um, the method as it stands for um, predicting uh, the treatment effect. Um, we do see improvement over larger sample sizes, um, larger numbers of studies, I should say, but um, it does still remain an outstanding question as to what uh, what sample size or what number of trials should be used as a minimum. Um, and we have seen, um, it, you know, discussions with FDA, sometimes they, they quote 10, sometimes 12, um, so roughly uh, kind of edging into double figures is, is what they, from a regulatory perspective, think is a minimum. Um, but this this really complements work of Lindsay Renfro um, and her colleagues at, at, uh, at Mayo who look at the use of uh, subgroups of trials, uh, maybe based on investigational centre or geographical region or other sensible um, splits of the data that might increase. And um, we're certainly concluding that, that it's possible with smaller numbers of trials, but there are um, many considerations before doing that. Um, and then a plug, actually, at the end. So really, as I say, I'm sitting at my desk. I'm trying to design my phase three trial. I don't have a lot of data. Um, but collectively, across the industry and across academia, we have a huge amount of data. So I would really actively encourage um, inclusion engagement from, from companies to, to collaborate. Um, and this has happened very successfully in a number of diseases, but really to work together to, to club together data and, and see if we can get more surrogate endpoints evaluated uh, moving forward. Um, and then I just have the remaining questions. Um, as I say, we, we have plenty of questions um, that remain outstanding after this work and, and all the other work done in this field. So. What do we consider to be an acceptable threshold for trial level surrogacy based on this this and other methods? Um, we've seen precedents for values of 0.8 or higher for the trial level surrogacy. This has been used in a number of applications already, but um, I guess it's an, it's an outstanding question for me at least as to whether the same threshold should be used across all diseases. Um, and some diseases it will be extremely difficult to achieve that high um, bound and certainly there will be um, areas where perhaps that's not needed um, depending on the disease setting and, and the patient's um, the patient experience. Um, knowing what is known to predict benefit versus reasonably likely. Um, so this is the wording taken exactly from the FDA guidance. Of course, it's uh, potentially open to interpretation and maybe based on a case by case evaluation, but um, it would be interesting to, to know what, what the difference between those, those two is. Um, and also how to incorporate variability across multiple different clinical trials. Even if you start with a huge meta-analytic database with many, many trials, if you then need to start thinking about specific treatment regimen versus uh, different therapeutic classes, uh, you know, treatment for a fixed regimen versus treatment until disease progression, or patients who are newly diagnosed versus those that uh, maybe have refractory disease, um, you could, even in that setting where you have a huge amount of data, very quickly find yourself in this small sample situation by having to split the data in multiple different ways. Um, and then thinking of using the surrogate in the future, how much extrapolation from your 
surrogate evaluation is justifiable? Um, how applicable would that surrogate be in the future to treatments that perhaps we don't know anything about yet, treatments that are yet to be um, developed? And again, how much data is, is enough data? So between four and six is potentially not enough based on what we've shown here, but is 10 the magic number? Should it be higher than 10? Um, can we split large trials into smaller subunits if we maintain the randomization? Um, and this is really um, open questions for, for discussion and for debate. Um, and with that, I thank um, everyone for listening and open for questions. Natalie, thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. That was really um, interesting, was really, really clear. Interesting, really clear. Um, um, and and uh, so I'm, 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 I can hear an echo of my own voice coming from your screen. Coming your screen. Um, it's, it's, thank you. <laughs> it's an issue which is, um, you know, very important across the pharmaceutical industry, but also for, for those of us working in the academic world, also, also important. Um, I'm going to start with a question um, of a clarification uh, from on online. Is this about IPD meta-analysis or aggregate data? Which, which are you assuming here? Assuming IPD, so I'm assuming individual patient data is available from these studies. Great, thank you very much. Um, Right, I'm going to hand over to James Carpenter now. I forgot to introduce James the last time I introduced him. Um, J James is from the um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and UCL. Um, James, can I hand over to you, there we go, to, um, to, to open the discussion. Yes, thanks very much, Ian, and, and thanks very much, Natalie. I'd like to echo Ian's comments. I thought that was a very clear uh, presentation, a very interesting investigation of, of an important question. I've got a couple of, of things I'd like to raise which are a bit more specific and then perhaps we'll move to the, the more broad implications of, of what you've done at the end. So one of the things that was uh, struck me when you were talking about this was the, um, the choice of the copula model. Some of them seem to give more attention to events earlier in the follow-up, perhaps the GAR model and the Clayton model um, is more sensitive to uh, events later in the follow-up. Do you think that the, the model should be pre-specified in advance or should we allow the copula model, the choice of copula model, to be uh, driven by what we in the, the data? So I, I think it's, I mean, I think in an ideal world, um, pre-specification would be perfect. I think there's some element of, um, of knowledge that could help to do that. So in certain disease settings, I would imagine our clinical colleagues would have a fairly good idea around, you know, the prognosis for patients if, for example, uh, moving to, towards disease progression is, is meaning that there's sort of a very short survival time afterwards versus potentially the, the opportunity to still have further treatments and further follow-up and, and maintain um, a pretty good disease state afterwards. So I, I think there will be some element of clinical knowledge that might help, but I think it would be very difficult to to know for sure. Um, I think it's it's certainly worthwhile. I think it, at least the pre-specification of the primary um, copula and what other models might be used as secondary or supportive analyses, I think would be very valuable. Um, and I certainly think that just picking one and not looking at anything else is, uh, is very dangerous. Um, so I, I guess I, I would say we have some information to inform, but probably not enough to know for sure that one copula would be best ahead of time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, th okay. I think that's very sensible. I think that's very sensible. I agree with that. I've got an echo now as well, like Ian had. Um, so in your simulations, you used an exponential model to generate the data. Generate the data. Do you think Do you the think results the... would be similar if you had a, a baseline hazard that was changing over time? Um, I think I think it's quite possible. I mean, I, I think so there was absolutely no consideration in here of some of the really critical elements that you would think about. For example, proportional hazards um, or other, you know, accelerated failure time models, for example. We didn't explore beyond. Um, I think I mean, for me, I think the fundamental is really the effect of the treatment. So how well the surrogate treatment effect could impact the uh, 
the true treatment effect or the effect on the true outcome. So I think as long as the models that are used within the copula um, as the marginal models are appropriate for the data that you have, then I would expect the inferences to be the same. But again, it's it's that very careful selection of the models that you use within the copula and the choice of the copula itself that might have the, um, the kind of impact. But if those are appropriately defined um, and the treatment effects are um, you know, as unbiased as they can be, then I, I think the results would be fairly similar. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So more broadly, if you're, if you're looking at progression-free survival, as, as you said in the talk, the assumptions of the copula model are, can't hold, can they, because of the way that composite outcome is constructed. Does that mean that you think, and given the results you found, that copula modeling is inherently a bad idea, or, or is it still, it's still a sensible approach? Hello? I think it requires a lot of careful thoughts and investigation. I think if just, just picking one copula without doing the investigation, as I say, I think is dangerous. Um, to your point around the definition of, of PFS here and how that would violate the copula, um, again, I think it's very much dependent on how much information comes from that uh, kind of long-term true endpoint versus how much comes from your shorter-term endpoint. Fundamentally, what we do is we take the event of disease progression um, and we take the event of death and we kind of put them together in one sort of foggy definition of, a, of an endpoint. Um, it's not always entirely clear whether that endpoint, um, uh, or at least those two individual events of that endpoint are on the same disease pathway. Um, it's not always clear how those different outcomes might be impacted differently by treatment. So the treatment potentially has a different effect on the probability of your disease progressing versus the probability of your disease becoming fatal. So um, I think overall, I would still support the use of the model. I think it's very much a case of just being cautious that you're investigating it very thoroughly in terms of how the dependence is uh, is formed. And, um, and as I say, in this case where you have a composite endpoint, I think I would recommend that you look at the individual elements of that composite endpoint as well as the overall grouped one. So in this case, to assess time to progression as well as progression-free survival to give a better overall picture of how how that might be impacted by the inclusion of the additional events. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So more broadly, you've sort of shown, I think, that you can't use these sort of methods uh, in, in the sort of data sets that you'd like to, likely to have within a company or within an institution. So are there any, any broader initiatives you think we should be taking to strengthen um, the sort of collaborations in which we can validate these surrogates? Yeah, absolutely. So there, as I say, there have been a number of um, successful um, kind of attempts at this already, or work that has been published, uh, work that has gone under regulatory review, review, and there are many ongoing efforts as well. Um, and these are really, um, at least the ones that I am involved in myself, are multi-company, um, so industry and academia um, consortiums, people coming together um, really from um, either by invitation by independent parties or me even making a public call, you know, at conferences and things um, and really getting people together to discuss um, how would be the best way to do this. So um, a lot of the examples are based on, um, for example, companies and study groups sending data to an independent statistical center yep. who conduct yep. the analysis. Yep. So, you know, you have perfect um, preservation of your data confidentiality so this individual patient data is not shared between companies but you have an independent group who can can lead the efforts and um, at least as I say there there have been a number of very successful outcomes already and there are ongoing studies that, that take this model um, and, and certainly I, I would say it's it's been very very uh, supportive and everybody's working towards the same goal so I would certainly say to anybody thinking about developing a surrogate is just um, don't hesitate to reach out to, to partners. It's surprising um, sometimes how people can be engaged in um, enjoying efforts and uh, and trying to move forward. Okay. I just say if anyone online has has any comments on that, please please do contribute if there are people with with experience of that sort of approach. James, back to you. I think that that's those. Those are the key sort of questions that occurred to me uh, looking through the talk and the, and the paper. So um, I'd like to 
open it up to comments from other people. I, I've got a few more points I could raise, but I think it's good to hear from others. So before we go, go to Dan, does anyone else online have any, a, any comments? Um, again, the difficulty of knowing. He's got a microphone that works. OK. Um, so Milan Joshi asks, um, can pilot studies indicate which copula functions would be suitable? Natalie, can you use pilot Natalie, studies? Can you use for pilot this? studies for this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's um, it's certainly something that that could be done. I think the the piece that might become challenging is being able to show that you're still pre-specifying what you're doing, uh, particularly when it comes to <laughs> discussing with the regulatory authorities. But you know, you could you could use um, subgroups of trials, small numbers of trials, you know, a subset of what you're doing to be able to to kind of test the water a little bit. I think how you do that would have to be defined up front because it's really important to make sure that you're selecting, um, you know, uh, not having retrospectively sort of seen the, the results. So, um, yeah, I think it's certainly possible to do. Um, it's also, you know, a good idea, as I say, to include additional copulas as supportive analyses um, and different validation measures. But certainly, I, I think pilot studies could be one way of, of sort of testing the water before you commit to um, to choosing one final model that, that that's going to be used for, for all of the uh, inferences. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dan, Dan Jackson, do you have any any comments you wanted to make? Well, uh, just a very sort of simple-minded sort of comment and, and, and question, I suppose, really, because I I, um, I I find some 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 aspects a little bit difficult. But um, I've noticed in in the talk and also in in the paper there's this R, R squared this is basically squared correlation coefficients for measuring surrogacy. So my sort of very simple-minded question really is: Is a correlation coefficient that's close to one or, or minus one, I suppose, really what people mean by surrogacy? Because when I when I think about, it, I think well, temperature in Fahrenheit is a very good surrogate for temperature in Celsius. And that would give me a correlation of one, of course, if I plotted those things against each other. But um, Celsius squared uh, would also be a very good surrogate for, for, for Celsius, assuming the uh, temperature is positive, I suppose. Uh, and in other contexts, uh, I've seen people insist not only is the correlation, so I suppose the reason why people rule out the quad, sort of quadratics and things like that is because they assume multivariate normality, so everything's linear, so maybe that's, maybe that's a bit of a, a silly point. But um, I know in other contexts, people want to assume not only is a perfect correlation, perfect surrogacy, but they also want things to go through the origin because they these, these things refer to treatment effects. And if something's a perfect surrogate, if it has no treatment effect for one, it should also have no treatment effect for the other. And the also insist that um, you know, the line goes to the origin as well as having a correlation of one. So all of this together leaves me a little bit wondering if, if sort of correlations uh, coefficients and their squared values are really a very good good measure of surrogacy. Is this really what we mean by surrogacy? And I'm I'm a little bit confused. And I just wonder if somebody could help me out with this, please. Yeah, so certainly my, I mean, my input here would be correlation alone is, uh, is certainly not enough. And this is something that we, we hear a lot. I think most strikingly from our clinical colleagues, sometimes we get the comment that, you know, the hazard ratio for PFS is 0.7 and the hazard ratio for OS is 0.7, therefore they're perfectly correlated. Um, so it's, it's a challenge that, <laughs> that we're certainly facing in how to interpret. Um, I think the second point on the, um, the intercept, so this certainly is feedback that we've had before where we have conducted these kinds of analyses. Um, certainly from clinicians, I think where we have to try and steer away from is that no surrogate is ever going to be perfect. Um, I don't think it's possible for a surrogate to capture 100% of, of everything, same as you wouldn't necessarily expect um, any endpoint to capture 100% of the potential treatment benefit. Um, you define a, a measure, a primary measure of a treatment benefit on a certain endpoint, and that's how you make inferences. But I think the, um, the real deep information, I would say, around your disease pathway and how do you know that your surrogate is really on that same disease pathway? Um, and are they impacted by the same, uh, in the same way by the same treatment, um, your different endpoints? It's all the kind of fundamental um, arguments, both for and against, um, and against surrogates. But I, I think certainly measures that are able to evaluate the variability in that treatment effect, what you want to know is is the treatment effect that you've seen on your surrogate, is it enough? Is it enough for you to conclude that patients are going to benefit by having this treatment approved? 
Um, and that, I think, is it's again comes back to this reasonably likely to predict as opposed to, um, you know, absolutely 100 percent gets it um, gets it perfect. I think it's got to be sufficient. It's got to be good enough to know that it's uh, it's worthwhile as an approvable treatment. Dan, do you want to come back on that? Um, no, no, no. I think like, like James, so it opens, so this opens the floor a little bit. I think, yeah, that's very. I, I just, I just, want, I'm not an expert on on surrogacy, but I do just see the different ideas bounce around. Like, uh, I'm sure I've seen non-parametric uh, correlate uh, um, measures of correlation used as well. And sometimes they seem to insist it goes through the the origin. So, so, so I think a lot of us are just a little bit confused on this. But it's just, it sounds that, that sounds like yeah, a very sensible answer to me. So now I, I, I'll, I'll throw a discussion open to the floor. I think. Okay, so we're, we're beginning to run out of time, but we have got time for another question from the floor. If anyone, I'm not seeing anyone typing one. Anyone want to say something? Um, okay. I, I suppose the, the, the obvious question, given the first talk, Natalie, is would you still use the random effects average for the second phase? You don't have to know the answer to that. <laughs> I'm sure I do know 100% the answer to that, but I, I think, you know, given a, a critical component for for the use of surrogates is being able to predict um, future trials, future results, um, you know, I think I would still stick with the, <laughs> oh, with the random effects yeah, just based on that perspective. Yeah. But um, I don't know if Ken is, is there. I think it's probably there, random yeah. as well. Uh, given the... Uh, I'm still here. There's an echo. Um, Given the uh, the need to predict, then I think the random effects might be sensible here. Yeah. 